Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. Today is Tuesday, March 31st, 2015. I'm your host, Rob Dew, and here's a look at what's coming up. Tonight, a generation of slaves. A look at student debt. Then, New York is moving ahead with full-term abortions with lethal injections into babies' hearts. And a look at the new PBS Ken Burns documentary on cancer. All that and more on tonight's InfoWars Nightly News. Well, if you're a TV head that lives on the East Coast, Monday morning your programming was interrupted by an emergency alert system. And this is something we've been talking about for many years here on InfoWars. The article from Paul Joseph Watson is titled, Nationwide Emergency Alert Test Causes Panic Confusion. TV viewers across America see unexpected message. The test began around 11 a.m. Eastern. It was broadcast in Washington, D.C., Indiana, Kentucky, Maryland, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Jersey, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. The emergency alert contained no details. It merely listed the states affected, and it said the alert would run from 11 a.m. to 12 a.m. midnight. Viewers in Sacramento, California also reported seeing the test, although it only lasted there for a few minutes. And I want to go to a report. I'm going to go to that later in this segment, but I just want to read to you a piece of it. And this is titled, Obama Launches Total Takeover of the Media. As next generation EAS systems become operational over the next few years, they will complement other public alert and warning systems now being developed, including FEMA's integrated public alert and warning system, iPause, and commercial mobile alert system that will enable consumers to receive alerts through a variety of multimedia platforms on their smartphones, Blackberries and other mobile broadband devices. They're also testing this out for video game systems. For those of you playing games like World of Warcraft or even uh, playing with your friends uh, like Mortal Kombat or something online, they'll be able to see these alerts. They'll be able to break through and give you these presidential alerts. Now, we were talking about this. This uh, video, particular video that we're going to throw to in a bit, we brought this out in 2011. So many years ago, we were talking about how this is going to affect you, and this is a way that the, you could see the incremental creep of government. They put the system in through presidential directive back in uh, February of 2011. Now, 2015 in March, we're seeing the fruits of that where these statewide multi-state alerts are going out with no real information. They're just testing the system. So when they do go operational, they will be putting out lots of propaganda. You could be sure propaganda like this next story from KX11 News 12, assault landing training exercise at NTRA Perrin Field. On March 28th, the first of the 143rd Airborne Battalion conducted exercises at North Texas Regional Airport. Soldiers hit the ground running March 28th, taking part in an assault landing exercise at the North Texas Regional Airport in Denison. We had a fictitious enemy situation in which we did detailed mission planning for said Lieutenant Colonel Krupp. It gave us a different look and a different piece of terrain to actually operate over. Also, due to the size of the battalion, we needed a large footprint in order to actually get the most value out of the training, the Lieutenant Colonel Krupp said. Now, we're going to go to a report here on Joe Biggs. I sent this to him and said, what do you think of this? What do you think this is really all about? And this is what he had to say. Joe Biggs here with InfoWars.com. Now, over the weekend, the 143rd Airborne Battalion conducted exercise at a North Regional Texas airport. Soldiers hit the ground running Saturday morning, taking part in an assault landing exercise at the North Texas Regional Airport in Denison. We had a fictitious enemy situation in which we did detailed mission planning for said Lieutenant Colonel Krupp. We had a fictitious uh, enemy situation in which uh, uh, we did detailed mission planning for why is Texas continuously being labeled as hostile? Why are all these enemy situations happening in Texas? What is going on? What is the military really truly planning for? And my other question is, is we spend millions and millions of dollars in taxpayer money to build these training facilities on government property so the soldiers themselves and their, their officers can train uh, without being bothered, without bothering other people, and go about it, you know, in a professional manner. We have no problem with that because that's what the money is for. 
But there is a big problem when you start bringing these training exercises off of government property and into people's backyards. It is a conditioning, it is a psyop to get people used to seeing military presence every day. Around 250 of the over 800 soldiers in the battalion took part in the airfield seizure operations, learning to take down an enemy. But this exercise was different. In the video that we're going to go to, the lieutenant colonel even says that typically training like this does not happen off base. This happens on base. This is the reason we spend the money on these facilities. And the fact that these guys are not using the facilities is why it's alarming that they keep moving all of a sudden from these bases and off into the civilian population. Typically, training is done on an active military base, not a public airport. But the change in location benefits the soldiers. It gives us a different look and a different piece of terrain to actually operate over. We're not doing this to scare people. We're doing this to bring awareness to the fact that this is conditioning. This is used as a psyop to get you, the public, to being used to seeing this kind of stuff happening all the time. So when it does happen, you're not quite ready. You just think it's another training operation. That's right, Joe. And what they do is they have a nice, pleasant sounding, monotone newscaster roll it out saying, they're doing this to benefit the troops. You're for the troops, aren't you? That's psychologically what they're doing. Because if you don't agree with this type of stuff, then you must be anti-troop. Even though they spend millions of dollars building these training centers on bases, like what you saw at Fort AP Hill when we sent David Knight and Joe Biggs down there to investigate that, where it was a training center that was built to look like an American city. Even though they say this training is for overseas, we've detailed time and time again and showed you the documents that it's not for that. It is dual purpose training that if anything should hit the fan, any type of emergency, the president can quickly turn these operations that are supposedly meant to be overseas and have, make these things happen right in our backyard, which leads us, some of the footage you saw in there was from an actual operation that happened in Fort Lauderdale over the weekend. Video shows troops training to intern citizens in Fort Lauderdale, also from Paul Joseph Watson. Footage out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, shot earlier this week, shows military and law enforcement practicing the internment of citizens during martial law style training. The exercise was accompanied by very little media coverage. A Sun Sentinel report said that the Broward County Police would be assisting members of the U.S. Special Operations Forces who are undergoing urban warfare training. The goal is to prepare participants in realistic, unfamiliar training conditions before they deploy for combat overseas, states the report. Residents were advised not to be alarmed by Black Hawk helicopters in the sky because we all know Black Hawk helicopters really don't exist. It's all in your figment. It's a figment of your imagination. And if you do believe in them, you must be a conspiracy theorist. Now I want to go to that report that I alluded to earlier in the show. Uh, this is from February 8th, 2011. Obama launches total takeover of the media emergency alert system. And we're going to go to break and then we'll be back with a lot more news. Stay tuned. It's the InfoWars Nightly News. And I'm your host, Rob Duke. InfoWars Life and InfoWarsLife.com is extremely excited to announce our latest release, Winter Sun, a revolutionary type of vitamin D3. Winter Sun is a premium quality vitamin D3 nutritional supplement. It is produced by extracting oil from healthy, nutrient-dense plants known as lichens. Every batch is analyzed for purity and D3 content. It's completely free of toxins and allergens. Simply put, if you want the best at an extremely low price, this is it. Winter Sun is the result of our pursuit of the best source of vitamin D3. The research and development took over two years, but the result, as verified by independent laboratories, is the best vegan vitamin D3 product in the world. Read the facts at InfoWarsLife.com about Winter Sun Vitamin D3. Not only does vitamin D3 promote a healthy mood, but vitamin D supports our memory and brain function, something the globalists are targeting. Visit InfoWars.com today or call 888-253-3139. The knowledge of the ancients, tried and true, trusted herbs and extracts fused with the latest nutraceutical science. Introducing the all new Ancient Defense Herbal Immunity Blend, crafted with over 14 key ancient herbs and extracts to supercharge and prepare your body for what experts admit is the most dangerous season of the year. 
we have rejected hundreds of other formulations in our quest to bring you what is simply the most powerful and comprehensive proprietary formula that we have ever created in the realm of herbal immunity. For the last two years, our team has been working with top doctors, nutritionists, and chemists to develop the ultimate nutraceutical formulation. Experience the benefits of combining over 14 ancient herbs and extracts with exciting new advances in nutraceutical science. For a limited time, get 25% off on this introductory offer. Visit ancientdefense.com or call 888-253-3139. Ancientdefense.com. Welcome back. Yesterday, I published a video called Arm Trannies Attack the NSA, and it was based off news reports that had uh, men dressed up as women who went into a NSA checkpoint in Fort Meade near uh, D.C. in Maryland. And at some point, there was some confusion that erupted. Police opened fire, killed one of the people in the car, and took the other one to the hospital. And in addition, looks like a couple other guards were injured during the melee. What was going on? Well, now we've got a little more clarity on this. Here's from the Washington Post. A fatal wrong turn suspected at NSA. The dark-colored escape was headed south on Baltimore-Washington Parkway. Its driver, and what authorities believe could have been a mistake, took a restricted exit, leading to a security post at the sprawling campus of the National Security Agency at Fort Meade, Maryland. An NSA statement said the driver ignored police commands to stop and instead accelerated toward a police vehicle as at least one officer opened fire. The stolen SUV crashed into a cruiser. One man died at the scene, and the other was taken to the hospital for treatment. An NSA officer was also injured, although officials did not say how. So what it looks like is that the men dressed as women, who I labeled as transgender, which at this point may or may not be true, one thing is for certain they were cross-dressing, were out partying with a third man at a hotel over on Route 1. At some point in the morning, they decided to go out for a joyride. They took the man's keys, took off, probably made a wrong exit, weren't thinking what they were doing because they had been partying up all night. There was drugs found in the car. Presumably, they were taking those drugs beforehand. I don't know. I'm just making that assumption. And then I want you to, to look at these maps. So you can see the detail right there. The third photo right there shows the Baltimore-Washington Parkway and the incident of the scene. Now, look right here. So here's the security checkpoint where they came through. It looks like they were trying to turn around and leave when at some point the police probably made some sort of verbal command to stop the car. Uh, the guys did not listen. Guys, gals, however they prefer to be called, I don't know at this point. And they were shot. Now, look at this detailed image of the incident. So it's obvious that they were not trying to go up to the NSA because the front right passenger side of the car hit the front right passenger side of the police car. So they were turning making a break for it around this area. From what it looks like, you can see where the car came to a rest, that that's what happened. And then you can see the body bag actually of one of the individuals there who uh, uh, obviously a horrible end to a night of partying. But what does this show? This shows the obvious overreaction of security officers anytime they are approached with something. And I want you to go back in time to about a year ago when we had a woman who was shot by Capitol Police uh, here's the CNN article. Woman killed during D.C. chase was shot five times from behind autopsy shows. On October 3rd, Miriam Carey approached a White House checkpoint and was approached by Secret Service officers. She made a three-point turn, striking an officer who was trying to move a barricade into her path before driving away, according to an affidavit filed in support of a search warrant. Police said the car sped down Pennsylvania Avenue toward the Capitol, where a security vehicle stopped, stopped it at Garfield Circle. Carrie put the car in reverse, hit a police car, and drove away as officers fired at her. The Office of the District of Columbia Medical Examiner said in an autopsy that one round struck Carrie in the left side of the back of her head. She was also hit three times in the back and once in her left arm. The report didn't determine in what sequence Carrie was hit. Toxicology tests determined that Carrie did not have alcohol or drugs in her blood system. But what came out in other eyewitness reports is that Police were surrounding her car. They had guns trained on her. She had an infant in the back seat, obviously was concerned for her and her baby's safety and took off, which looks like happened in this same situation. People get scared when officers start pointing guns at them and they want to get out of the situation because with the millions of reports that we see, well, let's not exaggerate, the thousands of reports that we see of police pulling guns on people out of nowhere, determining that the citizen is the criminal without you know, justifying it in any way, shape, or form. We see citizens getting shot by police, 
for little or no reason. Some justified, a lot of others not justified, people being choked out by police. So obviously when people have guns pointed at them, they do tend to freak out and not act in a normal manner. Maybe they aren't listening to commands because they're in a flight or, or a fight or flight mode, I should say. Now, that's in direct contrast to what we see when the Secret Service drives inebriated into a crime scene. Here's from ABC News. This just happened a couple weeks ago. Secret Service Director Joseph Clancy insists, no crash at the White House, no videos erased. Uh, the new chief of Secret Service today insisted in recent reports of a crash at the White House by potentially intoxicated agents driving a government vehicle are inaccurate, and he pushed back on any suggestion that the agency deliberately erased surveillance video showing the incident. With several cameras in the area of the White House, video from certain angles of the incident were lost because by practice, the cameras tape over the content every 72 hours, Clancy said. Nothing was deliberately erased. And what do those cameras show? The vehicle, which was containing Secret Service agents, drove through an active crime scene set up after a woman left behind what was considered to be a suspicious package, according to accounts by Cummings and Clancy. That's Elijah Cummings, a Democrat from Maryland. The video Clancy has reviewed was saved because of the probe into the suspicious package, not because it related to a subsequent and separate allegations of employee misconduct. So Secret Service agents can come back from a retirement party inebriated. They flash their badges, bump into a barrier, drive into a crime scene, yet nobody freaks out because they're part of the system. They're part of the good guys. Anybody else happens to happen upon one of these, you know, secure facilities, un unaware that they are doing it, try to turn around, try to leave the area. Well, they're shot at. This is how it happens. There's always selective and different enforcement for if you're a government person than if you're a normal citizen. Case in point, Hillary Clinton. And we're going to get to that in one second. And I want to illustrate how this labeling of people, just like I labeled those guys transgender, which may or may not have been accurate at this point, we don't know. I want to go back to an article just from a couple days ago. Uh, Austin police label InfoWars inf engineer, sovereign citizen gang member for challenging improper application of traffic law. An arrest record obtained by InfoWars shows APD considers the technician to be gang-affiliated and a member of a sovereign citizen movement, despite him never having been convicted or arrested on a gang-related charge, nor self-identifying as a sovereign citizen. The contractor's arrest record inexplicably contains notes warning officers that he is a dangerous individual, even though he has no history of violence. Under additional remarks, one of Austin's finest also noted 10-0, Caution, sovereign citizen, and there you can scroll down in the article and see the arrest uh, record there. It says dangerous gang intel, and below that additional remarks, 10-0, sovereign citizen. So we can see how it's okay for the authorities and government officials to label people as dangerous, even though they aren't really doing anything dangerous other than driving down the road. They happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But what's obvious is that what Hillary Clinton has done with her emails is a complete violation of the law, and we have a report from Leanne McAdoo to explain that. There are four things I want the public to know. First, when I got to work as Secretary of State, I opted for convenience to use my personal email account, which was allowed by the State Department, because I thought it would be easier to carry just one device for my work and for my personal emails instead of two. Nope. Turns out that first statement is a lie. Not only did just weeks earlier Clinton admit to using two phones. The big question. Okay. iPhone or Android? <laughs> iPhone. Okay, in full disclosure. Blackberry. And a Blackberry. The Associated Press obtained State Department documents showing Clinton emailed her staff on an iPad as well. And obviously an iPad is a lot bigger than a second phone. So Hillary Clinton's excuse that she needed this for convenience shouldn't trump national security. Now not only do we see Clinton mixing personal and work chats, here she responds to an email update on drone strikes with some interior decorating questions. Plus, it seems like she can't seem to figure out how to use her iPad. Seems competent. Let's make her president. Second, 
The vast majority of my work emails went to government employees at their government addresses. You'll recall that it was actually the hacker, Guccifer, who revealed Clinton's private email address and the fact that she seemed to be running her own secret spy network. Three men were involved in her private intelligence gathering efforts. They were feeding her intel on, among other things, Benghazi. What difference at this point does it make? Now, the State Department pledged that they turned over all documents pertaining to the Benghazi investigation. We went through a thorough process to identify all of my work-related emails and deliver them to the State Department. At the end, I chose not to keep my private, personal emails. Not only did Clinton set up her own private homebrew email server in order to control the flow of information, but it turns out Clinton actually wiped her server. She admits that she destroyed the electronic copies of her State Department emails on this private server after the State Department subpoenaed those emails. She basically told the congressional investigators what they could do with their letters and with their subpoenas. She uttered, she could have taught Richard Nixon a lesson. So it's definitely not looking good for Hillary that she wiped her server. But then again, we are talking about a woman who was fired from the Watergate investigation for being unethical. Are you ready for Hillary? So if I'm not ready for someone who tries to cover up the death of four Americans and the fact that it's an arms deal for Al Qaeda and she runs her own private spy email system, then I'm anti-women? Is that how it works? I guess so. Well, let's move on some more pulling behind the curtain. Here's an article we published today on Infowars.com. Every young person should see the Fed's startling numbers on student debt. This is from Simon Black of Sovereign Man. I'm going to read these statistics out. So five of them, and they should really freak you out, especially if you're about to go into college. 40 million Americans are now in debt because of their university education. And on the average, borrowers have four loans with a total balance of $29,000. It's like a nice car that you're never going to see, never going to drive, never going to get to look at or show to your friends on Facebook. According to the Fed, student loans have the highest delinquency rate of any form of household credit, having surpassed credit cards in 2012. Since 2010, student loan debt has been the second largest category of personal debt just after a home mortgage. The delinquency rate of student loans is now hovering near an all-time high since they started collecting the data 12 years ago and only 37% of total student loan balances are currently in repayment and not delinquent. That's right, two, two out of three are either behind payments, in all-out default, or have entered some sort of deferral program delaying their payments with a small percentage still being in school. Now that doesn't bode well for you, especially if you're about to go into college, because these numbers are only going to go up, and you cannot get out of this debt even if you declare bankruptcy, if you die, it gets passed on to your relatives, those who co-sign the debt. Your parents would get saddled with it. I mean, it just doesn't look good. And they, they maneuvered all these things back in the day so they could get more people into the college system because at the time it was only a place that elites went. But I've got even more information on this. This is out of Consumer Affairs. Student loan debt may be far worse than we thought. Each month, young adults are burdened with 25 to 30% or more of their net pay dedicated to student loan debt. A total outstanding student loan debt in the U.S. has now surpassed $1.2 trillion, with more than 40 million consumers having at least one student loan. And uh, more than 650,000 federal student loan borrowers who began replaying their loans in 2011 have defaulted by 2013. This is creating a huge bubble. This is going to be bigger than the financial bubble. You'll see it's going to hit in a probably less than two or three years. You're going to see massive amounts of students doing what this young lady is doing right now. Out of the Detroit Free Press, students refuse to repay loans to protest college debt. Sarah Diffenbacher is on debt strike. She is refusing to make payments on more than $100,000 in federal and private loans she says she owes for studies at a for-profit college that she now considers so worthless she doesn't even include it on her resume. Durfenbacher said she received an associate's degree in paralegal studies from Everest College in Ontario, California, and later went back for a bachelor's degree in criminal, criminal justice before dropping out. She said she left school with about $80,000 in federal loans and $30,000 in private loans, 
But when she went to apply for a job at a law firm, she was told her studies didn't count for anything. My God, $100,000 and your studies don't account for anything. And it goes on to other students out there who are refusing to repay these loans out of protest because they're receiving worthless degrees. Now, not every degree out there is worthless, and I'm not trying to say that. And college is good for, I'd say, a lot of, I'd say more than half the people. But there is a large number of students who are going into college getting these liberal arts degrees. They're getting out. They can't do anything with them. So they are saddled with this college debt, and they're getting jobs as waiters or waitresses. They're in the service industry somehow, and they're unable to repay those loans. Therefore, they're going back, moving in with their parents. It's not the type of scene that you'd like to see in a growing millennial population. But the millennials did do everything from inventing the Internet to everything else so gracious with their online personas. So maybe I shouldn't even be uh, cutting them some slack because they should figure out a way to get through this. I'm tongue in cheek there. I always see articles say how millennials are the next greatest thing. And maybe they are, but they'll never know it because they're so saddled with this debt. But what do they do teach you in college? That's one thing I'd like to know. Kid Daniels put out an article today. University requires students to apply for free speech firm permits. That's right. They're teaching you that you don't have constitutional rights in this country. The right to free speech, the right to free press, the right to anything. In fact, they've got a whole system outlined for you to apply for permits and what zone you can go talk in because they don't want you to talk about anything other than their co-sponsored curriculum. The public university, which is California Polytechnic State University, required student Nicholas Thomas, who was handing out flyers, not only to get a free speech permit, but required him to seek approval from school officials over the content of his handouts and restrict his activity to a campus free speech zone. So they have a whole list of uh, restrictions and before you can embark on your free speech, which include you must check in with the Office of Student Life, allow the school to copy their IDs and wear badges signed by an administrator, reported the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, who is helping Thomas sue the school. Even then, would-be speakers are regulated to so-called free speech zone, and badges can only be issued from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays, although the Office of Student Life pledges to work with any student who wishes to engage in expressive activity on evenings or weekends. Additionally, students must register in advance for outdoor events, and the Office of Student Life must approve all flyers and posters. So that is what they're teaching you, and you're, and you're paying for this. You're going into debt to learn how to be a free speech slave because when you get out and you want to go protest a presidential election or a, a local official or public servant coming in, they're going to teach you where you can go. They're going to teach you that you can't go in and disrupt any type of open forum. They're going to teach you where and where not you can stand and have your free speech. And they're going to tell you what kind of signs you can have. That doesn't sound like a free republic to me because it says, shall not be infringed at the end of the First Amendment, if I do recall correctly. Totally ridiculous. Now we go to our next story, and then we're going to go to break, and we'll be back with some abortion news, and I'm going to sit down with Anthony Gucciardi to talk about some cancer updates. But here we are from the Daily Mail. Oh my goodness, the earth is getting greener. Researchers reveal a huge expansion in the world's trees. And what does that expansion do from? It's due from carbon, the evil carbon that we put out. The world's vegetation has expanded nearly 4 billion tons of carbon to plants above ground in the decade since 2003, thanks to tree planting in China, forest regrowth in the former Soviet states, and more lush savannas due to higher rainfall. That must be in Africa and other places. Scientists analyzed 20 years of satellite data and found that the increase in carbon, despite ongoing large-scale tropical deforestation in Brazil and Indonesia, according to research published Monday in Nature Climate Change. The 4 billion ton increase is minuscule compared to the 60 billion tons of carbon released in the atmosphere by fossil fuel burning and cement production over the same period, said Yi Lu, the study's lead author and a scientist at the University of New South Wales. So they always try to throw that in there, even though everything's getting greener because the carbon levels are rising, they want to tell you that's bad. Guess what? The Vikings colonized Greenland back when there was more carbon in the atmosphere and temperatures were warmer because climate change happens whether we want it to happen or not because volcanoes are always going to be spewing their ash and the sun is always going to be shining at least for the next several million years, we predict. But they don't want you to think about that. They want to tell you that breathing's bad. Obama goes to Africa telling you having air conditioning is bad, yet then he gets in his jets. Prince Charles tells you how bad the climate is then gets in his helicopter to travel 80 kilometers. 
It's always different for you because you have to give up your standard of living so the rich and elite can live this beautiful, lush, opulent lifestyle. Now, we're going to go to break, and we're going to come back with some abortion news that is I find really disturbing out of New York. And then we're going to sit down with Anthony Gucciardi and talk about the latest developments in the cancer propaganda medical industrial complex. Stay tuned to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew. Used since before the days of the Roman Empire to support the body's natural systems and enhance overall health. Introducing the new InfoWarsLife.com oil of oregano formulation, a highly advanced nutraceutical form of this key herb that has been traditionally used by civilizations for thousands of years to promote health. We have now procured the most high quality and potent forms of oregano oil on the market, sourced from top leading manufacturers to ensure a concentrated level of bioactive ingredients extracted directly from the wild herb and sealed in easy to use capsules. You will no longer need to endure the burning of liquid oregano on the tongue. Wild crafted from the Mediterranean oregano species that experts agree is one of the most powerful and most challenging to acquire. This winter season, it's more important than ever to secure this true form of oil of oregano. Now available in our limited first run at InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com or call 888-253-3139. Another major health threat, this one in Toledo, Ohio, where everybody in the entire city has been told not to drink the water. Ohio's governor declaring a state of emergency. Did you know that the average person uses about 80 to 100 gallons of water at home every single day? If there's a water emergency, will you be prepared? Panicked residents forming long lines throughout the day. We're here at a supermarket in Toledo. You can see the shelves empty where water once was. To stay safe and healthy during a crisis, you must must have access to safe, clean water. Water which will not be available at your local grocery store. There's a mad dash on right now to stock up on supplies. The ProPure Pro 1 G2.0 water filtration system is a must have for every modern, independently minded household. Protect your family's safety during an emergency. Go to InfoWarsStore.com today to purchase your ProPure Pro 1 G2.0 water filtration system or call 1-88-253-3139. Welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. Our next story comes out of the Daily Mail, and it's a loving abortion story. You're going to love this one. New spa-like abortion clinic opens to destigmatize procedure with fluffy robes and tea on arrival. A new Washington, D.C. abortion clinic will have a spa-like feel with fluffy robes natural wood floors, and tea on arrival in an attempt to help destigmatize the procedure. Carafim, which opens this week, has a no-frills attitude when it comes to informing people with what they provide. One of their advertisements read, Abortion, yeah, we do that. Christopher Purdy, the clinic's president and founder, said he was inspired to start Carafim after working more than a decade promoting family planning and HIV prevention in developing countries. That's right. Once he got done with his eugenics operation over in Africa, he decided to come back and kill the little black babies in Washington, D.C., because that's what it's there for. And if you look at the statistics, more black children have been killed by abortion than have been born since abortion became legal with Roe versus Wade. Yet, they're putting a beautiful fluffy robe around it. Remember the video of the girl who was going in for her abortion and made it look like she was being all cool and trendy by doing it? Totally Disgusting, but it doesn't stop there in D.C. In fact, in New York, it's getting even worse. Startling new abortion bill approved by the New York House. The New York State Assembly has recently decided this past week that shooting poisons into the heart of babies and pushing full-term abortions is in the best interest of women. That's right. The package of bills will allow women who are in their third trimester of pregnancy, 27 to 40 weeks along, to abort their babies in the womb through a procedure that involves shooting deadly poison through the unborn baby's heart to terminate them. The law would be changed to allow abortions to occur for any reason deemed relevant to the well-being of the patient, including physical, emotional, psychological, and Family, familial factors and the mother's age. So basically any reason you can come up with, you can kill the baby up to the third trimester. Isn't that loving? Isn't that helpful? That's what we need. More abortions. Not the fact that we've been drinking so much BPA in our water and we've basically killed the fertility of the people in this country where these people, 
they, they don't realize they could actually go out and make money by ha delivering these babies full term and then putting them up for adoption to a loving family who would love to take care for a baby no matter what the race is. So I encourage you out there, if you are thinking about doing that deed at this time, that you do look into those alternatives because there are hundreds of children that are being killed each day that need to be placed into homes and that there are loving homes out there. So please consider doing that. And speaking of gross blood and guts, before we go into these cancer stories that I have, there's video that just came out, blood stains found atop Georgia Guidestones. Was well, mysterious occult symbol used for ritualistic blood sacrifice. And that's right, a guy flying a drone over the Georgia Guidestones, which incidentally I've been to and shot footage of, and he sees these, it looks like a blood stain with the blood actually dribbling off onto the support columns. Now these, this particular Georgia Guidestones monument has been attacked in the past with paint and other things. You could see that in the video that I shot back a few years ago. But uh, it just makes you wonder what is really going on. Now they have security cameras placed over across the street pointing at the Guidestone. So if this was a blood sacrifice and the video shows nothing, well, maybe it's just like that Secret Service video. It gets recorded over every few days. So no video of, of any occult activities would exist. But it does look like something fairly recently happened, whether it's a bird flying in with its prey, which seems like a lot of blood for a prey animal or a prey bird to have brought up there, or it could have been red paint, although that definitely, to me, looks like blood. And there's a lot of interesting facts surrounding the Georgia Guidestones. They're profiled in in-game, the blueprint for global enslavement. The top one is interesting. It says, we will live in perfect harmony with the earth, and the population shall not exceed 500 million. That's worldwide population, 500 million. A lot of us are gonna have to die for that to happen. Incidentally, everybody that I met while I was out there shooting the Guidestones footage was very anti-New World Order, which I think is a great sign. So earlier in the show, we looked at the myth that you have to have a college education and go into massive debt to be a successful person. We've also looked at the carbon myth and how more carbon dioxide is bad for the planet. And now I want to, to do this with, uh, with my good friend here, Anthony Gucciardi. Look at the cancer myth and that we can never, ever find this cure for cancer. Um, and now there's this big PBS documentary, uh, Cancer, the Emperor of All Maladies, produced by someone who I've actually respected in the work he's done. Ken Burns is executive producing this. But it really doesn't look at the causes of cancer. It only looks at the people who've fought around for these big pharma cures. Anthony, what's going on with this? Uh, where, are they going, where are they missing out in, in, this, in the big picture on this documentary? This documentary really reminds me of the Susan G. Komen Foundation. Remember the uh, Buckets for the Cure? Right. They worked with KFC to create buckets oh, of right. fried chicken for the cure. <laughs> and if you actually... They Susan, forgot about that one, but that, yeah, yeah, that's Yeah, exactly. One. They basically were raising money to treat cancer and research cancer and everything like that, but what they weren't telling you about were the real issues like BPA, over 130 studies just on the relationship between BPA, bisphenol A, which is a plastic chemical, and water bottles and other plastic items, between BPA and breast cancer, 130 different studies. Wow. And, you know, it's kind of like Angelina Jolie chopping off her breasts. Instead of telling young women about BPA right. or about, you know, GMOs or about any of the things that we constantly come in contact with, like high, high fructose corn syrup, which contains mercury, the list goes on and on and on. No one wants to talk about that because that's not sexy. It's much easier to say you have a gene and you're doomed and there's nothing you can do because that alleviates any actual action that we need to be taking. But we're going to fight and spend millions of dollars on these treatments and give big pharma run of the mill to produce all these toxic treatments that may or may not help you. And that's what we're going to be concerned with. We're not going to ever be concerned with the cause. And that's what this documentary focuses on. It focuses on all on all these scientists who've worked for years and have created toxic cocktails to put into kids. And now, well, now we've, we've really worked on childhood cancer. We can actually treat it now, but at what cost? I mean, some of these treatments, uh, they admit, even cause brain damage to these poor kids. But nobody's ever looking at the causes of cancer. Well, it might kill the cancer, but it'll also kill you. It's really a fight to survive the treatment more so than a fight to survive the cancer at many levels. But we could also look at, no one draws the parallels between these concoctions that they're making that they admit is toxic in this documentary, which has some good points, really, and things like Prozac. Because, you know, in the 80s, they knew when they ran the test that Prozac was actually leading to suicide, horrible things like maybe 
crashing a plane into a mountain, for example. Of course, I'm talking about the fact that the co-pilot was on antidepressants at that uh, recent recent flight crash on right. purpose, where he did mm -hmm. it with some type of motive. But no one talks about that. And Harvard researchers came out and said that actually, yes, Prozac was causing suicide and that the public was being treated like guinea pigs. That was from 2004 in BBC. It was a professor, actually, and he was speaking out against it. Now, the cancer industry obviously is on the same parallel with Eli Lilly and company who made Prozac. They're making millions and millions, if not billions of dollars on all of this while we're sitting there. And the best part is they're disabling our ability to do anything when they say it is our genes, just as you talked about. Right. Because if I were to tell you that you can prevent cancer, and it is genetic at some levels to a very small degree, but it's actually environmental factors that trigger it's those genes. what triggers genes, the genes, yeah, yes, exactly. Then you would actually have responsibility to do something about it. You could not go out and eat garbage and eat McDonald's and you know drink water bottles full of BPA, or you might actually get breast cancer. Or drink or Mountain Dew or some right. other soft drink right. over and but over But it's again. a lot easier right. if, as a big pharma representative, I come out and say, the fight for cancer is so hard, it's genetic, we're researching it, give us the money. Mm -hmm. It's actually easier for people to give money and donate money and buy into this right. than to actually take control of their lives. So that's why people just like dislike very much so in many ways. I mean, there's angry comments to, on videos like this, as much as there is good comments, more so, obviously good comments, but there's that 10% that are just diehard against this because it actually means that they have to take control of their life, which right. is they very hard. They can't just put on a pink ribbon and go, I'm helping. Right. I'm, I'm making a difference. They can't buy just, just by KFC. Yeah. And, you know, it, it also, <laughs> exactly. in terms of solutions, so we're not just sitting here attacking the cancer industry, which also has no solutions. I would encourage everyone to look up research on things like turmeric and iodine or whatever, but mainly let's talk about turmeric for a second. And just as this is going by memory, I believe that 98% of the cancer cells that they actually went up against in turmeric, that the brain tumor shrunk. I mean, everything was actually drastically resolving in mice. And then olive oil, that's actually the most impressive one recently. Hmm. They put olive oil in a Petri dish with cancer cells and in less than one hour, the cancer cells were killed by the olive oil compound. And we've known for a really long time that the olive oil compound is very powerful. But when they put it in a Petri dish, it killed the cancer cells. So shouldn't that be in the documentary? Right. No, they want to focus on these scientists who, who sit in labs. And it all looks real sexy. You know, they're putting things in, in vials and spinning stuff around in centrifuges. And they're really working really hard to spend all that money that we've given them for cancer research. Well, um, uh, was it Nixon declared a war on cancer in 1971? Where are we now? 500,000 a year die. It costs 50000 at least per treatment. So you, you estimate the millions of people that get cancer each year, they're diagnosed, 50000 per head. I mean, that's billions and billions of dollars going in to fund this, plus the research on top of it. Do they really want a cure? I don't think they do. I think they want a treatment. I think they'll cure maybe 10 15% or get people in remission. Those are the lucky ones. But those who aren't, they're just being, being put in this mill housing, uh, you know, paying for all this, this insane amount of uh, poisons and toxins that they want to put in the body. I mean, describe what is chemotherapy like for people who people don't know? Well, you know, let's talk about chemotherapy for a second. To give you a good example, one of the studies is that turmeric and iodine block chemotherapy from working. Oh my God. Right. So It'd be horrible. So you have a nutrient that everyone knows turmeric is beyond a superfood, right? Mm -hmm. It does so many things to your body. If you're taking something that's super healthful and amazing for you and it's blocking chemotherapy, what does that tell you? Yeah, right? chemotherapy is <laughs> not good for you. <laughs> exactly, and, but the, the, the documentary admits that. It admits yeah. that it's extremely toxic. They're basically just saying, which is the saddest part about this documentary and everyone who watches it, yes, we have no idea what to do, so we actually have to basically kill you. Right. And they admit it will probably kill you if your body can't handle it. And that's why you know, 10, 15%, like you were saying, do actually fully recover pretty quickly from all this because they have a really powerful immune system and their body can rebuild at a cellular level really mm -hmm. well and everything. But they are actually poisoning your body to the, to the level that the cancer cells are dying to. Right, it's, exactly. like, it's, like, it's like you have you know, some type of toxic stuff in your hands, like a bunch of like oil barrels, some old oil barrels, you jump in the fire too. Yeah. It's burning everything so that the cancer cells die. We found black mold in your bathroom. We're going to burn down the house and see if that gets rid of the black mold. Exactly. And if that gets rid of the black mold, then you're cured. Right. You know, that, that's the mentality of it. It's burning down the house instead of how do, we, how do we prevent it? And then are there natural ways that we could treat this that aren't? Because cancer's been around. It, it's not, but it's never been around in these levels. And we're not, we've never seen it at this level now. And it is epidemic. And, and I mean, it is the emperor of all maladies, as they call it. 
But what they want to do is divert you with this sideshow, this really well-produced sideshow with millions and millions of dollars and billions of dollars going into this. Oh, and, yeah. and with no real results, no real measurable results that we can all depend on. And uh, what, what would you suggest for people to read and learn more about what they could do if they do find themselves with cancer? I mean, how, how they could help themselves before they even go to a doctor and get scared into all these toxic treatments. This is such an old medical system documentary. And I know that because I know many actual MDs that would recommend the same thing I'm about to recommend. And it's to go to the National Library of Medicine mm -hmm. and type in, you know, uh, preventing cancer or type in some of the herbs and everything that you've heard about, like olive oil, turmeric, iodine, you name it, ginger, uh, garlic has sulfur compounds mm -hmm. in there that absolutely devastate cancer. There's so much. And this is PubMed, okay? PubMed is the National Library of Medicine av made available to the public. It's all of the top journals, everything. It all goes through PubMed. So it's not like you're a conspiracy theorist if you Google olive right. oil and cancer, which all the mainstream media you know, admits it does kill the, the cancer in the pizza you're just. But on PubMed, you can verify everything. And if you type it in, you have conclusive proof that all of these things prevent cancer, and it's thousands and thousands of different nutrients and substances. So it ultimately will answer your question. And then more so, there's so many MDs that now use this and will tell their patients, hey, you should be doing this to prevent it now instead of actually waiting way down the line when you do get cancer, because it's the last response of your body. Your genes do play a role, it's just your genes screaming out for help, and if you keep bashing your body over and over again, you are going to be sick. I mean, that is the definition of disease. It's you know, mm -hmm. getting rid of your natural ability to defend yourself. Totally, totally agree. I mean, it's just amazing at what goes on out there. I mean, from the global warming, to going to college, to cancer, the media, the mainstream media has one side of the story, and it's never, live your life with freedom and creativity and independence. It's be part of the system, be a slave to the system, help fund the system through all this stuff, and it's really disgusting. Anthony, thanks for coming in. Thank you, appreciate it. All right. And that's going to do it for our show tonight. Thanks to Anthony Gucciardi and Joe Biggs and Liam McAdoo for helping out with this news broadcast. And like I said, this is what it's all about. The mainstream media wants to portray one side of the story. They never want to show you both sides and look at things objectively and openly. But that's what we do here at Infowars.com. And you can help out with that by becoming a member of PrisonPlanet.tv. It's your membership that helps fund this studio, helps fund putting our reporters out in the field. Everything we do here is with that subscription to PrisonPlanet.tv that you can share with up to 20 people. So you got 20 Info Warriors for the price of one. And that's about all we have for tonight. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time, 7 p.m. Central. PrisonPlanet.tv. From the water table to our soils to the atmosphere itself, our world is becoming more and more toxic each and every day. But it's not just the air outside that's toxic. Indoor air has been shown to have two to five times higher concentrations of pollutants than even outdoor air. And most Americans spend 90% of their time inside using toxic chemicals within their homes. There are more than 42 million smokers in the United States. Well over a thousand types of mold and mildew linked to numerous conditions. And don't forget the fact that six million Americans Americans live with pets they're allergic to as well. When I began to research these statistics, it was clear to me it was time to start cleansing my lungs in order to combat the toxic environment that we cannot escape but that we can fight back against. Made with organic and wild cultivated herbs and manufactured in the USA, the new InfoWars Life Lung Cleanse is here in a convenient spray bottle that can be brought with you throughout any toxic environment. Now available exclusively at InfoWarsLife.com or by calling toll-free 888-253-3139. You are watching the InfoWars Nightly News, which airs 7 p.m. Central at InfoWarsNews.com. And your support is helping us defend liberty worldwide.